Okay, hi everybody, it's Wendy Cherry of the Sanctuary Radio Show. It is Wednesday and we are back in the Sanctuary Radio Show Summer School. So welcome. And I have a guest here today. I consider him one of my brothers. We actually met on a trip to Kemet. So many of you, if you follow me or you read my book, you know that I went to Kemet, which um, people know as Egypt. Uh, the land of the blacks and we studied there together and we bonded we bonded just like that from day one and um, we actually had a similar situation that um, with jobs leaving jobs like within two weeks of each other so um, and becoming entrepreneurs him a full-time entrepreneur me a brand new entrepreneur so welcome his name is Mbwebe Ishangi welcome he says how are you I'm great. I'm so right. happy that you're on. So he is a second time guest of the Sanctuary Radio Show. So welcome back to the Sanctuary. Good to be a vet. Word. Absolutely. So uh, hi, Kimberly. So um, we are going to take a second. I'm going to ask him to share information about himself, um, to tell us who he is. And the title of it is Financial Literacy how to live off of your investments and retirement and savings during a pandemic. So can you tell us who you are? And while you're doing that, I'm going to share this with my other group. Okay, cool. Um, greetings all. Uh, give thanks for tuning in to the Sanctuary Show. Obviously, you know, Wendy's doing amazing work. Um, just a little backdrop um, for me is, um, you know, we're all going through something actually, you know, obviously financially. And that's one of the things that we're thinking about most is, okay, well, how can I take care of my money and protect it and even possibly grow it, even though we're doing, going through a, a recession slash pandemic. Um, and just to give a backdrop of who I am and how I got into this, uh, I had worked for the National Basketball Association for 12 years um, as a brand identity marketer. And on March 13th, 2017, uh, I was abruptly fired from my job uh, not because of my work ethic, but because of basically social media posts that I put on my page that deals with the upliftment of Pan-African or African-centered rather people, uh, information and education. Uh, obviously that didn't fit their brand or their shield, what they're about say, let me go abruptly. And the first thing I thought about is, you know, I could call the EEOC. This is, you know, this is job discrimination. I should be able to do whatever I want to do on my own watch. But the ancestors have a way of working with you. And I think the ancestors, I just come back from doing a business trip in Costa Rica and uh, where well, we're working on a Black Land Matters project. And basically uh, the ancestors were saying, no, don't fight to go back onto the corporate plantation. Be thankful you've been kicked off and live your purpose. And you know, I'm a heavy reader of spiritual and, and historical information pertaining to African people or the upliftment of your mind and your self elevation of self. And the first thing that came to mind was I was thinking about is uh, the alchemist, Paulo Coelho. And it talks about how a person, you know, in their life's journey of, of trying to attain something, they might, you know, it, it's, it's a heavy, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle at most times and you're by yourself and there's not a lot of support. But right when you feel like you want to quit, most people don't realize that they may be a step or two away from achieving that goal. So I equated what was going on right now with losing my job and fighting between the, 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 Cho a choice of either trying to get my job back or actually totally leave corporate America as a whole. And I chose the latter. And in doing so, raise these questions. The first questions are, you know, I have, and I always pose, pose this to my clients, what would be the first thing you think about if you were to show up at your job on a Monday or you're about to, to clock out on a Friday and they told you you were being let go? The first thing you think about is your finances, your money, because, you know, <laughs> this is my source of income. Right. Uh, and the second piece is, do you have uh, enough saved uh, and it, do you live paycheck to paycheck, which over 60% of Americans do. Uh, right. and, and the other th the third one is if you are that type of person that has this job, even though you hate it, you've been there for a long time, uh, it gets to a point where you do end up uh, in retro retrospect saying, well, you know, I really can't complain. At least I have a job. Right. But if you're that type of person, then basically you need to go back to that first question. What if on a Monday or Friday clocking out, you lose that job? we're all going to be in that position at some time or another. And many, uh, many, some of us, a lot of times of our careers. So I was in that situation. I'm 40 plus, I'm losing my job. I got to start all over uh, or figure out what I'm going to do next. Cause I was always doing my side hustles. 
and I decided that I wanted to understand money at that point. Even though I'm in my 40s, I was saying this when I was in my 20s, but now I'm in my 40s. And it's best for me to now use this time to re-educate myself about what finance is in. And, and it took me to this journey to where now I've created uh, the Crypto World Financial Sustainability Movement, where we talk about ways to uh, money method metho methodologies to live off your savings and investments. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to unpack a lot of that. <laughs> yes, let's unpack a lot of that because you and I were in the, um, were, you and I were in the same boat um, there for a minute. Well, let me just say this. Many people are in that boat that we are out of, which is called the plantation, mm -hmm. your job. Even if you love it, even if it fulfills you, you are still trading time for money. So these are concepts that I had to get into my head. Trading my time for money. If you work for somebody else, you are creating wealth for their business with your time, with your talent, with your ideas, um, and all those things, and you are feeding their children's children. And so what happens is you are getting a little bit of money, but you have to, if you go through what is the traditional route, um, you, you turn 67 or 72 now, and then you retire, and then you have fun, or you do things that you want to do. So it took me a while to understand that because I'm very traditional, a Gen Xer, a third, second, third generation college goer from my family. Um, education is very important with my family at HBCU. Um, whole family went to HBCUs. All of them got post-secondary degrees, some PhDs, and I got my bachelor's and um, I was just tired of working for other people and I wasn't being treated well, right? So you think about all those things and one of the major things that human beings want is security and safety. And the illusion, and I'm sure you agree with me in Buebe, is the illusion is that your job is your security and safety. Mm -hmm. That's a human biological need is to feel safe. And we think because we have a check coming in or whatever that we are safe. And many people just found out during COVID that they weren't. <laughs> so from March 13th, that's like my cutoff. That's like the line of demarcation for me. It was before and then after, right? And I think that after March 13th, some people were let go, but then I think everybody woke up a little bit and is like, it could be me next. And how do I prepare? So you are here to share with us how we can prepare and to use what we already have or maybe to get a little bit more or start from the beginning um, to put ourselves in a better situation so we are not floundering. Yes. Um, and that's the thing is, you know, <clears throat> I've, uh, we're in a recession. But we just have to own up to that. And that's yeah. something that people are in denial with because we're also getting hit with the pandemic. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to equate the two. Recessions are uh, cyclical. And that's something that I began learning in my journey to being financially educated. Number one, let's just say this, is you'll find that uh, they don't teach this, right? They don't teach you how to manage money. They don't even teach you how to buy a home, which is a fundamental thing you should learn because everybody wants to own a home, right? Well, everybody um, needs somewhere to live. Right. Right. Or the bottom line is managing finances. Yeah. They don't teach you these things. They tell you to save, but they don't tell you about returns on the saves. They don't tell you about. And, and here's the other thing is that um, that day on March 13th, the 14th, the next day, it hit me that no employer is obligated to pay you for the rest of your life. That one day you're either going to be laid off, fired, and if lucky, you'll retire. But at that point, that relationship of them giving you money for trade and time is going to end. Still, though, every 30 days, you got bills. You're going to have bills to the day you die. So yeah. the question is, you know, how do we, the, the unfortunate thing is that most people don't understand to figure this thing out until the reality hits them where they get laid off or whether they get fired or if they're lucky to retire. They understand that their retirement money is not going to give them what they thought it was going to give them you know, because they put in these traditional money markets. So those are the things that, you know, they're not going to display and tell people 
at large that look, there's other ways to benefit. Why? Because it affects their bottom line. Exploitation, uh, being able to make money off of your money, which is arbitrage. These are tactics that this, this country, you know, we got enough to deal with, right? Being black. <laughs> now we got to deal with being, you know, financially uh, uh, having this, uh, being uh, discriminated against. But it's also because we're, we're illiterate. And that's the thing. It's like, it's been, we've been taught that managing money is hard. Yeah. It's complicated. It's just simple math. It's not geometry. It's plus okay. and additions and divisions and subtractions, you know, and multiplications. But okay. it's just a matter of just understanding. Go ahead. No, I'm going to say that that's helpful. That um, mm -hmm. so you feel like sort of like the elephant. And when they say, you know, where do you start eating an elephant? You just nibble off the ear. That's where you start. So mm -hmm. to just know that it's subtraction and, 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 and hopefully addition and yeah. multiplication. That's, the key. And <laughs> that's what it is. So I think um, just learning some of those tips um, can help anybody. And you know, you don't have to be in a certain situation. I feel like the majority of the people who are watching my show anyway may have a little something to work with. And you may, and so what the goal is, is for you um, to give us, to drop little seeds, um, to do things that we might not have thought before. And then people might want to take your class. Cause I took, was it already a year ago, last year yeah. that I took your Probably class? Did. Yeah. So you offer a class too, where you share in a broader um, perspective and more tools and more um, to do's like the actual checklist. So what can you share with people? What are some like maybe a few tips to, to get started? What do people need to do to get started and even knowing where they are as far as their money is concerned? Okay. Um, the most basic thing that I, I pretty much start out with folks is that as I mentioned, expenses right so we all have expenses you're going to always have expenses a lot of people don't know what that actual number is so i call it and i love acronyms i call it the fen or financial endurance number this is the number that you need to endure for the month you need to make this amount of money to cover all your bills so what you're basically doing is you're accumulating you know your t-bills your your mortgage or rent your car notes your insurance uh, even miscellaneous, like if you consistently buy lunch, you know, what does that amount to for the month? So you know what that number is. And when you know what that number is, then you could counter it with or cross reference it to your salary. And your salary is basically, can your salary manage that or equal that amount? Now, if you find out what that number is, you'll find either you're in the red or the black with that. Okay. In most cases, you may be in the red with it. And now you understand why you might have to get a second job or you know, ask for that raise or whatever to, to be able to meet that level. But in most cases, people are in the black. They actually have a surplus from their paychecks. It's just they squander it. They buy frivolous things they don't really need. There's very little investment. And on top of that, for those that are smart, that do invest, they've been investing it in the wrong models. The models that we've been taught to put it in are volatile, highly volatile. And as you mentioned, you know, and I'm sure that your listeners um, have, and I will pat myself on the back and say I didn't get caught up this year. Is okay. January 2nd, I closed out my 401k. Okay. I closed it out because I knew, I didn't know to this level, but I knew that a recession was coming. Okay. And I knew the last recession, last recession, I lost $250,000 oh, in my savings, so right? Okay. And it was not, and this is not forgivable. They don't give it back to you and say, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. The under the fine print is this is a gamble. You're in Vegas. You know, in yeah. Vegas, the house always wins. So the way it works is when you put your money in these uh, traditional money markets, savings, bonds, CDs, uh, 401ks, IRAs, you got to look at the history of return. And what do they tell you? Oh, don't worry about it right now. It'll get better. It's going to go up and down. We have bull and bear markets. So you, you're worried about touching it 10, 20 years from now. Yeah, that's true. But if you think about all the money you've lost in those 10 to 20 years, you should have much more in the end. And on top of that, ask for that raise, what if, whatever, to, to be able to uh -oh, meet that level. Through. But in most cases, uh -oh. people are in the black. Right. They actually have a surf. I'm not getting the feedback. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I think we're good now. So in, in most cases, you'll find that um, with, uh, I was going to say, the 401ks, um, ah, I got caught up. Black. And they're, like we're been, we've been bamboozled to put our stuff in there is basically. Right, right. <laughs> and, 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 oh, so what I'm gonna say is when, so when you become a certain age and you're ready to uh, pull your money out, 
what if it happens when it's during a pandemic or what if it happens during this recession? So say for instance, the last recession of 07 through 09, what if I was 65 right. and I was trying to retire? Well, that figure, $2.7 trillion was lost between the senior citizen age, age group. These are people post-retirement that have put away their money, did their job, you know, did their bid, so to speak, and worked 30, 40 years. And yep. that money's supposed to be there for them to live off of whether the market came, crashed, and they lost that money, it wasn't replenished. So it left them with dire, being in dire straits, having to lose their home, move, moving in with their children, weren't able to afford their doctor visits or their med medicine. So we don't know when recessions happen and you don't wanna gamble that situation right. by continually putting your money in something that at, at a moment's time can go south. And in that case, you know, there's no, again, there's no forgiving. So there's, there's right. no, they're not gonna give the money back and you have to start all over, which is the problem. We reinvest. Well, I think that there is just like in any other thing. So first I want to shout out Kawan in DC, uh, and Isa, well, Kawan in Maryland, and uh Isa in DC and Renee is in Brazil. Welcome you all. If you have any questions, please type them. But what I wanna also get us to consider is that this is a reprogramming of the brain. Absolutely. We have done the same thing for so long and we think, um, so like our parents may have said the 401k was good for them in the 50s, 60s, 70s, however old our parents were, right? 80s, 90s, whatever. And, um, but what they did back then may not work for us in the modern times in 2020. So yeah. Did you want to make a point there? Yes, because okay. we got to understand when did, when did 401k systems start, right? Before okay. 401ks, it was pensions. Okay. Think about pensions, what pensions were. Some of our grandparents had pensions where they worked their jobs and when they retired, they got paid for the, for the rest of their lives. Yes. They got to receive the paycheck. Yes. That was a model for that era because one, there wasn't as many workers as we have now. There's not tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of employees now. Right. So, or, so, so in, th in that situation, they, businesses could afford, and that's also because this was industrial age. So this is when steel, copper, the railroad magnets, uh, moguls, these things were all the jobs were in America. So they could afford to pay someone indefinitely, even post-retirement. When companies started to realize it didn't financially make sense for them to do that indefinitely for the rest of, you know, everyone's lives because people are retiring and then you're hiring new people, which is going to be more retirees eventually. Yep. They decided to bring on the 401k system. The 401k system, I think, started in the late, uh, in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't it know was, it was that recent. Yeah. It was designed. It wasn't designed to last this long. It was a Band-Aid situation for the pension. Okay. Okay. So when the, the 401ks came, they had their highest uh, returns in the 80s because what this did is it took the onus off of the companies for putting away retirement money for you and it yeah. put it onto the employer. Yes. I mean, the employee rather. So the employee now had to put their money into and, you know, based upon the advice of these, you know, sharks called uh, brokers would tell you where to put the money at. They would tell you, well, if you put in the more aggressive, you know, policies, you'll, you know, you'll make a good return, but you'll get less back or, you know, the whole volatility of it. But the bottom line is, once they started putting their money into the 401k system, it took the onus off of the corporations and put it onto the individual. But and they had their highest returns in the 80s and in the 90s. But then okay. recession started coming more often. And then they realized this isn't going to work either because eventually the market is so unpredictable yeah. that there isn't that return. But they kept it on the low. They didn't tell you that. They won't tell you how volatile it is. They don't tell you the returns are roughly uh, one to uh, two percent. If you were if you were to invest in your 401k for over 30 years, you're going to get about two percent back. Wow. So let's e let's even think about this because maybe people don't have a 401k i don't know what everybody has but just think about it think about a credit card so our grandparents generation if you are traditionally if you're caribbean family african descent american african american family your great great grandparents did not believe in credit first of all they couldn't get credit right they believe that being in debt to someone was slavery. Yeah. So they paid everybody in straight cash, homie. Like I remember my grandfather had the back of an envelope 
and he would just write down all his figures. My mom even bought him a calculator. He did not use it. He wrote it down or it was in his head. Yeah. And he would calculate all of his stuff and he would have straight cash. He would have his little wallet in his back pocket and that joint used to be fat, right? Because he was an entrepreneur too. And then when I was little in the 70s, now this is on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. I see my cousin uh, May here. Um, and when I was little, my grandma thought she was cute with her sister because she had a pennies card. Mm. It was the first time that women were actually, not even black people, but women were able to get a card if their husband signed for them. Mm. It used to not be that women could get credit cards. So my grandma then had her pennies card and she would be at JC, pennies is JC pennies and Sears, Roebuck, right? So they would go and then they would have that. But it didn't used to be that way. We were, we our great, great grandparents and grandparents knew that credit could be, could be, because I know that you have a different philosophy and you can share about credit, but if you use it wisely, not just running up your bill and then you can't pay for it and then you're in debt. But I know that you, the way that you teach your system is that you can use it in a way to support you. So, so just think about that. That the, the credit cards only came out in the 50s. And if you're saying 401ks were in the 70s, 80s, they are all ways to make you feel secure. And this is not necessarily a way to be secure. So what do you what do you think about that? So um, the very first credit cards card was a diner's card. Okay. So it was high end, I forgot to name it, but it was a diner's card. That was the first credit card and allowed people to pay without cash. And, um, you know, if you think about it, there's a, there's a, actually a movie out called The Laundromat with Meryl Streep. The Laundromat, okay. The Laundromat is pretty, pretty good. It just talks about uh, shell corporations, just a higher level of how things have been, how they monopolize things. People are in a position, to take advantage. Um, and most of them do it frivolously. They do it at the expense of, you know, the, the weaker piece of people, but we're not doing it that way. But anyway. Credit cards, yeah, we used to be the type where, you know, our grandparents, we didn't have a bank account either. We would put the money in under our mattress, right? our <laughs> pillow. Some people's pillows, the, the feathers, it wasn't feathers, it was dollar bills or whatever. That was what made it so soft. Yes. And, or we would dig it in the backyard because uh, it was a practice, as you mentioned, this is something post-slavery yes. that we didn't have much. So whatever we had, we held on to and then whenever we, uh, we didn't know the concept of, we did barter, but we didn't know the concept of owing. And we wanted to, we wanted to pay somebody back and forth. That was a principle that we kind of lost because America doesn't go by that principle anymore. So anyway, when you think about the way the monetary system's been set up is when you have uh, now uh, credit, credit now enables you to leverage and use other pe people's money. Now I got to talk about the banking system before all of this, okay. because that's what this is all about, the banking system. And the banking system has a way of monopolizing uh, everyone, not just people of African descent in the United States. It's it, it, around the world. It's, it's, they monopolize everyone. And how do they do that? They have this thing that's called the fractional lending uh, system. And the fractional lending system allows banks to uh, percentage X your deposits. So in most cases, it's 10% or 10, you can 10X a person's deposit. So if you put in $100 into your checking account from a check, the bank automatically turns it into $1,000. <clears throat> this thousand dollars all they need to do is keep 100 on the books your deposit and they have 900 free dollars that they can then lend out to anyone and when they lend it out affixed to it is an interest rate this interest rate is shared only with themselves not the actual person who seeded the loan in the first place which is you and i right. so when we wonder why the banking system has these luxurious buildings and these amazing accounts, and they have all these millions of dollars in advertisement, it's because every time someone takes in and deposits something, no matter what the amount, if it's $100, if it's $10,000, they're 10X, and they 10X that, and that money is then put in. So this is also the reason why gentrification has been so effective, oh. because we have financed our own gentrification by putting money in our neighborhood banks. Because again, they 10X those deposits, and then they put out loans to developers that are not from our community, that comes into our community to rebuild 
push us out. And then the bank in the return of the interest that they have to pay, the developers have to pay them pockets that money and we get zero. And on top of that, in your banking account, you have service fees, right? You got to have a minimum balance. You, you have, uh, uh, you can only have like so many drafts during a month, you know, or you get charged. So basically you're paying them to manage your money and we're thinking that's all they're doing. No, they're actually 10xing. They are multiplying and they are generating and leveraging through arbitrage our money. But we don't understand that. So we keep putting it in there and it's been done effectively because why now we have is direct deposit. Yeah. Prior to direct deposit, banks had to wait for you to walk in right. and give you your check. Now you could go to this bank or that bank, this branch or that branch. So the banks still made money, yeah. but they had to wait. Yeah. Now with direct deposit and everybody, you know, corporations pay some on Wednesday, some on Tuesday, some on Friday, some weekly, some bi-weekly, some, some monthly. So in the case now, banks have a, they've created through, through direct deposit an influx of continual money coming in on a daily basis from people and they, getting paid. they sell it to you as a convenience. So check this out. Yeah. You, you give them money, right? You in your deposit, but when you want to take a loan out, they'll double the interest rate. You're giving them money for free. Right. Right. You deposit it because you, you, because it's been set up that the only way I can pay my bills is through a checking account or so we think. Okay. So we need, we, you know, most places, even though you could still pay your stuff with cash, but we understand that the hassle it is right now. And we want that, you know, with the expedient transaction. Yep. So we would rather go online and send everything through online. Press return is done opposed to sending it through snail mail, writing it, well, not even writing it, doing a money order, which costs money too. But the bottom line is they've made it so comfortable for us that we don't even see. Yeah the game that they've done to us that it's so easy, but they are making money hand over fist because they know guaranteed every Tuesday, they're getting a check from me because my employer pays me every Tuesday. Well, I want to unpack a few things there. So it was funny. Well, first of all, I want to shout out my VSU peeps. I got uh, Lorenzo and I got my mom's sister, Pin Pin. So first of all, when my uncle died, when my, when my uncle died in August of 98, we were cleaning out the house and we found mad dough in the freezer and I had never heard of that I was probably 20 something in my late right. I was 28 right? Right, right and I opened up the freezer and I'm like yo <laughs> and it was frozen so I couldn't really tell and then I'm looking and I'm like mommy right. she's like yeah that's what people that's what black people do they don't trust the banks yep. and yep. so that was my first at 28 that was my first um introduction to something like that the other thing is the comfortability. So, because I like to speak metaphysically too, whenever I'm talking to my guests, the comfort level that we had before Corona is, and, and, and Isa also is saying, Isa is my sorority sister from Virginia State. She was saying that in Africa, she's also from Sierra Leone, the Temne people. And she was also saying that in Africa, they still move in, in, in cash. Mm -hmm. So that's something that they do. And then um, my niece is like, let me go look in the freezer. Don't look over here. <laughs> I should only look here. Right. So the other thing is that the convenience. So how convenient was everything before COVID? We were so super chill. We didn't even know how to cut our own hair, do anything for ourselves. We have become very... Um, relying on other people. And you talk a lot about self-reliance and being able to be sustainable in th some of the ways that you live and some of the ways that I live. And so it's one of those things where we think it's so convenient and then you get got. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, March 13th, like I said, is my line of demarcation for um, COVID is it's like, I, I just been trying and everybody's at their own pace, trying to awaken myself and to learn these things and learn from people and don't just side eye people because it's not something that I've heard of before. Um, I try to learn new things and them, them asses was woke up on March 14th when you had to stay home, you had to stay home with your children and then you couldn't just run out to the store and you couldn't do the things that you were used to doing. So I'm hoping that you are 
turning in inwards and you've had four months to talk, sort of turn inward so that you can be more reliant on yourself and on people who you trust to learn new things, to do things differently because you can Google the largest transfer of wealth during COVID, just Google it for yourself and you will see people that don't look like you. First of all, we're losing our money and we're losing our lives during this time. Black people are dying during this time and they're also, they're losing their money unless they are uh, tapping into their entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial gifts and talents and moving away from the fear. So let's talk about that. You were talking about, we, we got on that because you were talking about the banks. Now, what happens if you have your money in a black bank? Does that make a difference? <laughs> no, they also practice arbitrage. Yeah. Okay, okay. They're just not as good at it. And when, and, well, I'll strike that. It's not that they're not as good as it. They also face discrimination. Yes. They're black. So there, there's those, those things too. But uh, I'm still, <clears throat> I'm still not, and I might get hit over the head with this because I am very African centered and about people doing for self, but the black banks, they don't perform, they don't have the amount of equity. And yeah. yes, if we all put our money in, yes. But at the same time, when you put your money in there, you're still financing that institution to do things that they're not on us to give us a return. And that's what, it, if I give you, if I loan you some money, then and you hold it for a long period of time and you also capitalize on it, it's only right for you to give me some of that return because without my initial deposit, you wouldn't be able to get what you get. But okay. the banking system isn't designed that way and we don't know that. So that's, I think that, so I'm not saying don't invest in black banks, but you're not gonna get a different experience as well. It's gonna be the same kind of experience. So are you telling us to just go remove all of our money and put it in our mattress, in the freezer, no. or in a tin can? Okay, no. so what are you saying? So what I am saying is, is a very good, good, very good point is it's time to rewire our way of thinking. Okay. And instead of being the used, be the user and not in a frivolous way as they do it, but okay. learn how to use it and take, use it as leverage. Okay. So what I mean by that is, okay, we live in a capitalistic world, so we're going to need money. Yes. Okay. So it's about how you use it. Now, if you take it out and put it under your mattress, it doesn't grow. Right. If you put it into the bank or you put it into a CD bank, 401k, whatever, there's potential for it to grow, but there's also potential for it to not grow. You can right. lose. Right. So the thing is, is that when it comes to credit is, and this is things I talk about in credit is there's a way that you can use credit as a way to build your portfolio to use their money instead of your money. Okay. okay. And how that works, I go into deep detail. I'm going to plug it. The class I do, Crypto Bowl Financial Sustainability Movement, I teach this course in five sessions on how you can use leverage to free yourself and live off your savings and investments. But one of the things you can do, and I'm not saying uh, it's about your credit score, it's not all about that, but for us starting out, because we don't come from uh, endowments and funds that are will air to us, we have to start from zero. The most tangible thing we can work on is facing the, the mirror and looking at what our portfolio looks at from a credit perspective. What okay. is our score? You know, and what your score is and then how can you improve it? I'm not talking about dispute letters. I'm talking about how do you use leverage to then pay things off in abundance opposed to that minimum $25 a month, which is extending the nature of your loan. As you mentioned, like with this coronavirus, that they extended people's loans, you know, they gave you three months off, right? but they're gonna want you to pay that three months. They added it to your loan in the end. And then there's a certain part of the year where they're gonna want you to pay all three of those, those, those months in one lump sum. There's no guarantee you'll be able to do that if the economy isn't going, right? right. And we're also facing a situation right now too with, um, with the unemployment page uh, checks supposed to stop in the end of this month. July 29th. July 29th that you know, if the economy is not in shape, there's going to have to be another form of bailout, right? There's, but the, the bottom line is, is that finances, you can't get away from it, right. okay? So we need to face it and then figure out, because there are people that are profiting during this era because they're using strategic methods, whereas we're sitting here and complaining about stuff and waiting on a stimulus check. We can be actually employing some of these same ideologies yeah. and get the same results if we stick to the blueprint. It's as simple as that. We don't need to deviate from anything. Just do what the rich folk have been doing. And then you, you may not be rich, but you'll be sustainable. And that's what I teach is about being sustainable first. Sustainable is reaching your FEN, your, your financial endurance number. What is that monthly number? 
And can I reach that every month? Now your job may allow you to do it right now, but your job can be let go. If your job, if you let go, then you can't reach that number. So how else do you do it? You do it through passive income. And I'll teach you how to do that in my course. So <clears throat> you said, and I think I lost my train of thought, but you said, I forgot what you said. Okay, I lost my train of thought, but it's a mindset. And really that's what I want you to understand. It's a mindset and it's a change. So we have to decolonize our brain. This show is all about decolonizing the brain. I'm, we are always, there's so many levels. It's like an onion. Yeah. You take one layer off and you like, damn, I, I got another six layers to take off. But you just do it in baby steps, a little bit at a time. So this is a way to do it because you may have been taught another way. I think it's just good to have a seed planted. This is what the whole show is about. A seed being planted so that you can consider or not something different. May I add? May I, add um, I like to use, now I talked about Paulo Coelho earlier about personal legend and about what is your purpose for life? We were not born to have a job career that that's going to let you go when you're at a certain age that can't take care of yourself for the rest of your life. Right. So one of the things I talk about is the, is the garden metaphor. The garden metaphor is um, something that talks about how do you, you know, when you have a garden, you know, it just doesn't start growing food, right? You got to put in time. Right. One of the things that rich folk talk about is this is called a five hour rule. The five hour rule is if you're not spending at least five hours a week on something that you're passionate about, you're being irresponsible. So right. for me, it's about, spending time on this with this garden metaphor of okay finances and food and survival it's a garden you got to toil that garden you got to go in there and rip up the roots you got to soil the oats to, to get it to the point where the soil is rich and then you got to plant it in there and you just don't leave it you got to come back tomorrow and check it out and scope it and yep. add a little water or take a little drain a little bit out whatever what i'm saying is that we've had all this time in our hands four months plus complaining and very little of us, I'm not gonna say that. I'm hoping more than not, more than a little of us have been actually actively doing something to make this change. As you mentioned, we've been, the things have been taken away from us. We can't go get our hair done. We can't go out and eat. We can't go to the club. So what are you doing with your time? And if you're not using this as like the pioneer age of how they were exploring the next frontier yeah. of what this new normal is gonna be, yeah. then you're gonna get caught up into whatever they give you. And for me, I can't settle that way. So for me, I got into gardening, actual physical gardening, like growing food, because what if the trucks can't make it? You know, I'm learning how to, yeah, exactly. I'm learning how to cultivate seeds. I mean, bartering is something that is a very real thing we may get back to is, okay, I got some tomato seeds, you got some potato seeds, like, let's just barter. Like it, money may not be an issue or it might not be uh, in existence in, you know, but if it is, obviously you want to plan so. But my point is, is that we have enough time on our hands that take your whatever hours of complaining, but then also divvy that up and put a little bit, a minimum five hours a week on figuring out how can I one, create and sustain food, shelter, and water. Clothing yes. don't mean nothing. We could be cartoon characters right now and wear the same thing every day. That don't matter. But right now, <laughs> right? But the, the main thing we should be thinking about is water, shelter, and food. And how can you attain those things? How can you maintain, grow, and share if you want to, at least with your immediate family? Yes. So those are the things that we have, you know, and, and it's, it may seem like it's a lot of stuff that we have to deal with, but what, about, what better time to do it? Because right. you have what a chance to be to independent. It. You have a chance to break yourself from that dependency, wake up and yeah. live your life purpose. You know, so that's to me is, is the focus is like really taking this on as not as a victim or I'm scared. Yeah, I'm scared, but I'm also going to fight. I'm actually going to create, I'm going to learn more. This is the best time to be learning stuff because there's no pressure. There's no pressure from our jobs. There's no pressure from, uh, to, to be there. You know, we can work from home remotely, but I, at the same time, we can pick up a book or put on a YouTube video or DIY and learn how to build something. This is the time to do it because we're going to need these skills because AI, I didn't even talk about that. Artificial AI. intelligence. It's going to take away these jobs. So, you know, right. we're going to have to have other skills. So, so let's go back to a few things. So first yeah. of all, hello. Boom. Boom. That's what's up. I started my okay. plant, my garden growing class again, right? in Copa yeah. Homeschool. Right. Uh, Israel is my teacher. 
So we about to get these sweet potatoes popping. Word. But I got this idea because you sent that video with that man who was hyped. And look, here we go. Yep. See? Little stuff. I'm starting how, little. How, how empowering is that? Yep. When you do it yourself, when you can yep. actually do it yourself and you see the results and it ain't hard. It's just the application, just doing right. it. And once you do it, it becomes contagious. So I got Lorenzo on here who um, who started his garden two weeks ago. And then Maya is here, my roomie from Kimmit. So she's saying, hey. Well, hey, Maya, what's up? Yep. Hey, hey. So it's, you know, it's not easy, but it can be. So it just depends on what you think about it. What's well, happening now is hard. Seeing people die is hard. Um, you know, if you're seeing your money dwindle, that's hard. So it's self is self reliance. It's um, nobody's coming to save you. I, I love to say that, and that's a shocker for some people. You can Google, the, and I and I I keep saying I'm going to remember where I found it, and I never do. But you can Google the title of an article from a few weeks ago was "Black People Died." and other people transferred about 72 million or billion dollars worth of wealth. Mm. That was the title. Mm. And that shocked me and it made my stomach hurt mm. because it's true. It is. And, it's, and, and if we keep doing the same things the same way, we're going to get the same results. So, and Webe is correct. Now is the time. If you didn't learn from that first month and a half of um, being shell-shocked, being scared, but knowing that you had the power. So this is what I'm sure and Bebe would share too. You have the power. Mm -hmm. We have the power. It's a mindset. It's a shift. This ain't nothing I was doing, think about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Nothing. But with new situations come new things that you got to do to make sure that you preserve yourself. So it's about self-preservation. I'm past the whole like self care, self care Sundays. No, I'm on self preservation every day. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? I need to eat. When they dry up the food supply, you you can go to BJ's or one of those big box stores or a small box store. Now it's not a hundred percent filled in there. There's a lot of missing stuff that we have seen before. Mm -hmm. You gotta have place to live, so you focus on the things that are the most prominent need at the moment. And then you work from there. So can you give us, we have a few minutes left. Can you give us maybe three tips? We're, we're gonna talk about your class and I'm going to, we're gonna get the website and places for people to go. I suggest taking the class. I took the class. It was very insightful. And you know, I'm gonna be talking to Mwebe to like refresh myself. But what are the three things that you can share that people can do immediately to feel like they're making some progress? Um, first of all, understand that, you know, we are our solution, as you mentioned, um, and we also are our ancestors, our living ancestors. I've basically just gone back in history, because I'm a history nut, in how did the first settlers, what did they, they faced, they didn't have cable, they didn't have, you know, uh, grocery stores. So what did they do? They learned how to take care of their basic necessities, as you just mentioned. So the first thing I would say is write down what's most of value to you. To me, it's water, uh, shelter, and food, yep. okay? When you have those things, three things working together, at least I can survive. So what does that mean? That means I gotta get my hands dirty. I gotta buy some soil. I gotta buy some seeds. If I have an apartment, which I have, and I don't have a backyard, I can grow indoors. There's hydroponics, there's grow bags. There's different things that you can learn on how to grow the basic foods that you need. No, you might not be able to grow steak, you know, but we should eat that anyway. But right. the bottom line is those things. And then secondly, I would say is to understand uh, the, the, your, 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 your resources, right? Where, how can you uh, allow your resources to grow? If you still have a job, you're lucky, uh, but also understand you're on the clock because the economy is gonna still start going down and there will be layoffs and you may be one of those that gets laid off. So what do you have in place yeah. to sustain your basic necessities? That's the point one I made. Yeah. So learning how to use finances uh, to put things away. The third step is, you know, I am going to plug it because I really feel like this works. And I only want to populate this, uh, this idea with our people because we're the least to get this kind of information. It's always over our head. And when we do find out about something, it's a fourth quarter opportunity. Um, take my class. Uh, CryptoWokeMovement.com uh, uh, is, I have a 
five session class. It's the Cryptable Financial Sustainability Movement, where I show you how to live off your savings and investments in five basic one hour sessions and put you in a place where not only are you, is your credit getting stellar within a few months, then you are also able to leverage that credit to live off of it and use other people's money instead of your own and, and depending on your paycheck. Doing all this without getting another job, doing all this without gambling in the monetary system that we've been tr traditionally told to invest in, using the ones that you don't know about that the rich people use, the Warren Buffets, the Oprah's, Susie Ormans, where they put their money, how they make their gazillions from. Uh, so right. those are the basic three things I want to leave you with. Okay, well, thank you. So I wanted to say um, two things. The black business, like we were, everybody was on this whole support black business thing, and that's awesome. Please mm -hmm. do buy my book, mm -hmm. support and baby's class. Anybody else that you know that has a business, do. I mean, we have to recycle the dollars into our own communities. I was listening to some money talks um, the other day, maybe last week, and they were saying that African American, and, and this is the disparity. So just, these are not the numbers, but this is the disparity in the numbers. Um, if, if black people communally have a hundred million dollars worth of, of uh, wealth together combined, Hispanics have 437 million combined. Look at that gap and they are way behind other people. Mm -hmm. It's just that they support their stores. They support their little, their little shops. They support each other with all the things they do. They're very communal. They live together. They live in small communities. I live here in, in Virginia and they deep over and they're always together and they're always hanging out and they're always doing stuff and they're always at each other's stores. It's that simple. Yeah. Supporting each other. And then the other thing is, is that black people are dying. COVID is one thing. But the underlying factors, I always bring it back to nourishment and health because that's what my um, specialty is in. And when you're stressed about money and stressed about where you're going to pay your mortgage or your rent or where you're going to get these clothes from or how you're going to get these kids educated or whatever, that diminishes your immune system. Right now, you need your immunity more than you ever have because there's a virus that, that they made up and that is attacking us and is killing us. So why not take steps to help yourself mitigate some of that, um, some of that stress that you can have that is also will can affect your body. Learn how to do a class. I'm going to have my teacher come on here and talk a little bit about um, how to grow your own food. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but Embuebe is here to talk about your, your money. And that's what every, it's all about money. Everybody is talking about money. And for those of you who may have been taught that money is bad, that's BS. Money is amazing. I love money. I love the smell of money. Money allows me to travel the world. Money allows me to do all the things that I love to do. So you can be afraid of money and you can say money's evil. You do that if you want to. Money allows you to have the access to do the things that you want to do. Money is energy. And if you're afraid, scared money, scared energy don't make money. Mm -hmm. It's an attraction. And, and we didn't even go into the energy of money and right. the emotions of money and how money is um, current. You either giving it or you're getting it. Right. And the stagnant money, we didn't talk about any of those things, but those things are true. So even... You know, if you want to Google Lynn Twist, the soul of money, and she breaks down the energetic perspective of money. So if you're stressed out, if you're worried about your next paycheck, and this is coming from somebody who was a new entrepreneur whose whole book tour was canceled and I got 150 books in my trunk. That's mm. who you're talking to. But I refuse to be afraid. I take the, uh, you know, the advice from my friends and I chew to meat and I spit out the bones of stuff that doesn't work for me because mm -hmm. everything ain't for everybody. So I understand that too. So please contact him. I will put the information in the box. You can follow him at Crypto Woke. Is that on all, um, all IG, platforms? IG, Facebook. I don't do Twitter. But now what about your uh, YouTube? Because you have some videos oh. on there. Yes. Uh, Yes, just just uh, just do a search for crypto woke financial sustainability, or just put crypto woke, and it'll yep. pop up. And I put series up there, and I have a new book coming out in about ten days. Okay. Uh, the the book is called A Pot to Piss In: Intergenerational Wealth Planning for Black People, and okay. just a little 
back on the pot to piss in why <laughs> um, back in the day status before there was plumbing and toilets. Uh, your status, if you had a pot in your house to, you know, where you put your release, you know, when you have to use the restroom where you can put it, you were considered high status, high elite status. If you had a, just a pot in your house where you would relieve yourself and throw it out. Well, we didn't have that. So now I believe we do have a pot to piss in and learning the yeah. methodologies that folks have been using to grow their money outside of the traditional ways we've been seduced to believe is the only way. So that's the title of the book. And uh, that's going to be out on July 17th. And where can they find that book? Uh, you can find it at, just go to CryptoWokeMovement.com or you can go to my other site, uh, TheGhettoTimes.com, B-A-G-H-E-T-T-O-T-Y-M-Z.com. And okay. it's being sold there as well. So I will put those in the show notes. So okay. I don't know, do you, have a, do you have a class that's already coming up? I do classes one-to-ones and on-demands. Uh, so actually I have, I just finished the course last night um, I do groups and individual, and I also have a self-paced course well as well for those that just want to get in and get it all done at one time. You can do that too. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is what I do for a living. Uh, and more importantly, again, I want to get this information out to our people because uh, no one's going to give it to us. No one's going to share this with us. And unless we do it ourselves, uh, we're going to find ourselves still not even beginning the race. And we need to get in this race and lap a few people. Well, I thank you for your time. Thanks as well. Thank you for everybody for joining us. If you have any questions, please continue to put them in the chat. Does anybody have any questions, first of all? And thank everybody for joining, but put them in the chat. We will go back and answer them. I will put all of um, his information in the, uh, in the show notes so that you can check it out. And next week, we will be talking about how important it is for human touch during this time. Again, this is a toolkit. We are adding more tools to the toolkit to be sustainable through COVID. The second wave is already here and post COVID because we're going to survive, but we don't want to just survive. We want to thrive. So that's, that's the goal of summer school. Thank you, Maya, for joining family. Yes. I will see you all the next time in the sanctuary. Peace. Bless.